Good morning, church, and welcome to this worship service here at the Orchard on our fourth week of Advent as we celebrate uh, the birth and the coming of Jesus. Would you join me in standing? And as you stand, let's reflect on uh, how John says that Jesus came into the world from John chapter 1. It says this, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born out of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Let's praise Jesus together this morning.
number. Sing we the song. Sing we the song of Emmanuel. This the Christ who was long foretold. Low in the shadows of Bethlehem. Promise of dawn, now our eyes behold. God most high in a manger lay. Lift your voices and now proclaim. Great and glorious, love has come to us. Join now with the hosts of heaven. Sages before you fall, grace and majesty, what humility, come on, bend me adore you. So come spread the news of Emmanuel, joy and peace for the weary heart, lift up your heads for your King. And sing for the light overwhelms the dark. Amen. The glory shining for all to see. Hope alive, let the gospel ring. God has made a way, He will have the praise. Tell the Christmas, everyone. Welcome to the Orchard. It's so good to be together for worship today. If you are a guest with us, uh, we're really glad that you've come. My name is Brad Weatherall. I have the privilege of serving as the campus pastor here, and we would love the opportunity to meet you. We also have a gift we'd love to give you if you'd stop out at our welcome desk in the lobby right after the service today. Well, this morning marks the fourth week of Advent, uh, this season where we celebrate the birth of Jesus. And in John's gospel, we read how the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And this is the profound reality that lies at the heart of all we celebrate each Christmas, that Jesus would leave the glories of heaven and humble himself 
by taking on human flesh. That the one who sustains the entire universe would be born as a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and laid in a manger and would humble himself even further than that to the point of death one day, even death on a cross, where he would then be wrapped again in grave cloths this time and laid in a tomb. This is the extent of his humility. This is the good news. We celebrate that Christ came, that Christ died for us, and that Christ rose for us as well. And so as we celebrate Christmas on this side of the cross and the resurrection, we can proclaim the, the words of Luke 1, 68 to 69 with great joy. That verse says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. So Christ came, he died, he rose, and we know that he will come again. And that really is the meaning of our fourth Advent candle. So the first candle reminded us to look up and center our thoughts on our loving God who sent us his son. The second candle reminded us to look back 2,000 years to the moment when God's great gift came to us in Bethlehem. The third candle reminded us to look within and to prepare our hearts to worship Christ this season. And the fourth candle reminds us to look ahead as we wait for our blessed hope for the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's with that future advent in mind, with his second coming, uh, that we want to go to him in prayer now. So would you join me in going to our Father in prayer? Well, Heavenly Father, we know it's a privilege to worship you each and every day, each and every Sunday, and yet we experience this special joy in worship at Christmas time. As this season fills us with wonder while we reflect on the grace that you have shown to us in sending your Son, and as this season fills us with hope while we look forward to his return. And we need hope. We need the light of your truth and your love to shine into our hearts because this world is a dark place and we're so easily discouraged. Underneath the surface of all the cheerful songs and the bright decorations and the familiar traditions of this season, there are sources of pain and heartache in each one of our lives. And sometimes the holiday season can actually intensify these things. It can happen as we grieve the loved ones who won't be at the table this year, or as we reflect on another year gone by and deal with some disappointment or some unmet expectation, as we keep struggling with our own propensities to give in to temptation and stumble into sin. God, as we groan in this fallen world, we pray that the advent of Jesus would cause us to abound in hope. Help us to remember how his first advent proved beyond dispute that you love us. For while we were weak, while we were still in our sin, Christ came and died for us. And help us to anticipate his second advent as well, which will usher in the final fulfillment of all your wonderful promises to us when sin and sorrow and suffering will be no more, when we will see our Savior, and when we will fall down and worship like the wise men from the east, rejoicing exceedingly with great joy. Oh, give us an increase of that kind of joy even now this Christmas as we look back on all that you have done, as we look up and remember all that you are doing to care for us, and as we look ahead to the day when all will be made right at the return of Christ. And it's in his mighty name that we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Well, again, it's so good to be together for worship today, and it will be good to be together for worship on Christmas weekend as well. We have four services next weekend uh, for Christmas. Three of them are on Christmas Eve. One is on Christmas morning. 
All four of those services will be identical, so we'll sing the same carols at each one, we'll pray the same prayers, we'll read the same scriptures, we'll hear the same message from Pastor Colin at each of those four services. So choose the one that's best for you and works best for you and your family. And know that while there is childcare available uh, for infants through three-year-olds at that 1 p.m. service on Saturday, each of these services will be very family-friendly, so we welcome all the noise and everything that will come. Uh, with that. And so please bring everyone with you. Uh, and please invite everyone to join you as well. Invite your friends, your family, your neighbors, your co-workers who need a place to worship this Christmas. Ask them to come and join you so that they can hear the gospel and so that they can join us in rejoicing in the hope that we have found in Christ. Look forward to that next weekend. During this next song, I want to encourage everyone to head onto the church website or open up the church's app, find that online connection card. Let us know that you worshiped with us today, and let us know how we could be praying for you this week. We love to serve you in that way each and every week. Uh, you can also use this as a time and opportunity to give. Again, you can do that online, or if you brought a physical offering with you, there will be boxes in the lobby right after the service today. And as many of you know, our church depends on strong year-end giving to our general fund each year to support the gospel ministry locally here through the Orchard, as well as through our global ministry partners around the world. And uh, those global partnerships include 74 missionaries and 10 organizations, and your giving is helping them uh, as well to proclaim the good news of Jesus. And we, as we approach this year end, uh, I just want to tell you how grateful I am for your significant generosity. Our year end giving goal is $3.8 million. And that is the goal just for our congregation here in Arlington Heights. And you have already given over $3 million toward that goal. And so the Bible describes giving. Yeah, we can praise God for that. Um, <laughs> The Bible describes giving as an act of grace in which we want to excel. And church, you are excelling in this act of grace. And so thank you so much for your generosity. Our remaining year-end need is just under $800,000. And so if you consider the orchard your church home and you've not made a year-end gift, I want to invite you to please prayerfully consider joining us as we seek to see the gospel advance both here through the ministry of the orchard and around the world as well. Uh, if you're interested and in information on non-cash gifts and other creative ways of giving, you can head to the Give page on the church website. You'll find information and the right people to contact there. But however we give, uh, let's give with these words in mind from 2 Corinthians 9, 11, which says, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which will produce thanksgiving to God. Child, is this you lead to us on Mary's lap is sleep? Whom angels greet within them, while shepherds watch our King. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard. and 
Let's stand as we continue to sing.
church will please remain standing for the reading of God's word. As Randy comes up, please turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. Scripture this morning is found on page 1014 in the church Bible. It's 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. Please have your Bible open at the passage that's just been read for us, and especially 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8. I want to speak today about our response to Jesus Christ. When Jesus was born that first Christmas, there were three responses. Shepherds and wise men came to worship him. Herod tried to kill him. And for the vast majority of people at the time and since, life carried on exactly as it was before. And the world never changes, and you still find these three responses to the Lord Jesus Christ, worship, hostility, and indifference. Now, we, of course, are with the shepherds and the wise men. And in this verse that I want us to look at today, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8, Peter describes our response to the Lord Jesus. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Now, Peter was writing here to ordinary believers, folks just like us. If you look back in verse 1, you'll see that these were folks who lived over a fairly wide region at the time, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. For us, that might be rather like saying uh, Illinois, Iowa, Kansas, and Nebraska. Ordinary people living in ordinary places. And these people were exactly like us in that they had never seen Jesus. Do you notice how he says that in this verse? Though you have not seen him. These people lived hundreds of miles from where Jesus was born. These people lived years after the birth of Jesus. They'd never seen him, just like you just like me. 
Now, Peter, who's writing to them, of course, he had seen Jesus. I mean, he had been there when Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. He'd been there when Jesus fed the 5,000. Peter was an eyewitness of the resurrection. He actually saw the risen Lord with his own eyes. But these people were just like us. They had never seen Jesus. And Peter tells us three things about the response of every true Christian to the Lord Jesus Christ. Even though we've never seen him, these things are true of us. And I want you to notice that what he says in this verse is that our response to Jesus is rather like a cord with three distinct strands. The first strand in our response to Jesus is that we love him. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And this reminds us that the heart of the Christian faith is a relationship with a living person. Peter says that the people to whom he is writing have been born again to a living hope, this is verse 3, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus. In other words, the Jesus who was born into the world 2,000 years ago is a living person. And the heart of what it means to be a Christian is that you come to love this person who was born into the world that first Christmas. In other words, to be a Christian is more than believing a creed. To be a Christian is more than to pursue an ethic or to try and to live a good life. To be a Christian at its heart is that you have come to love a living person, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was born into the world that first Christmas. You've never seen him, Peter says, but you love him. That's the first strand. The second is that we believe in him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him. And this is remarkable because these ordinary Christians, like us today, had experienced a great trial of their faith. If you look in verse 7, Peter talks about their faith being tested. You've been grieved, he says, by various trials. And it may be that when Peter speaks about you do not now see him, it may be that he means you don't right now know what he is doing. And you will know this experience if a severe trial comes into your life you will find yourself saying, now, why is this happening? Where is God in this? What is he doing? I don't understand it, you'll say. And then some kind people will sort of stumble around trying to say something that is helpful, and when all is said and done, you won't be any further forward. You'll still be saying, I don't get it. I don't understand it. Where is God in all of this? You do not see him now. So here are these people, and they're enduring great trials. They've never once in all of their lives seen Jesus, been born a great distance from where he was, and they've been born a generation after that time. But Peter says of them, and this is true of every Christian, you believe in him and you love him. Now, if I love God... Only when he gives me what I want, I do not really love him, right? If I love God only when he gives me what I want, I do not really love him. If it's only when he gives me what I want. And when a couple get married, they make a vow, a pledge to love each other for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. And that's how it is with a believer's love for the Lord. If I love God only when he gives me what I want, I do not really love him. And the same is true for trust. If I trust God only when I can see what he is doing, well, then I do not really trust him. An Oxford professor by the name of Basil Mitchell uh, framed a parable about the nature of faith that I've found really quite helpful. It goes like this. He says, picture yourself in an occupied country 
during a time of war. And one night, you meet a stranger, and over time, you get to know him. He tells you that he leads the resistance movement in this occupied country. And he tells you that he wants you to join him in his work. Then he tells you that there will be times when you do not understand what he is doing. And he looks you in the eye and he says, when those times come, I want you to trust me. Well, you give him your word that you will, but then what you find is that trust isn't always easy. Sometimes in the network that the resistance movement has in the country, um, you send a message to him asking for help, and he responds and gives you what you ask for. And then other times you send him a message and you get no response. Once in a while, you, you see him from the distance, and it seems that he's actually in some conversation with the, with the enemy, and you, you, you say, well, how, how could that be? And, and is he really on our side? And then you remember, he said to you, you will not always understand what I am doing, and he asked you to trust him. Now, here then is the distinguishing mark of a Christian. We trust Jesus especially when we do not understand what he is doing. In fact, that's the very nature of what trust is. If I trust Jesus only when I can see what he is doing, then by definition, I do not really trust him. So, here's what it means to be a Christian. It's a relationship with a living person. We've come to know Jesus. And in coming to know Jesus, we've come to love Him, and we have come to trust Him. And then there's a third strand in this cord of our response to Jesus, and that is that we find joy in Him. Peter says, though you do not see Him now, you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. What a wonderful phrase that is. An inexpressible joy... Well, that's a joy that you can't put into words. And then Peter says that your joy is filled with glory, and that means that this is a joy that comes from knowing the glorious future that Jesus Christ has prepared for you. In fact, Peter has already referred to this earlier in these verses that were read for us. Back in verse 6, he says, in this you rejoice. Which leads to the question now, well, what do we rejoice in? And the previous verses make it clear that we are rejoicing in our future hope. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to what? A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice. You rejoice because you have a living hope. And Peter describes this living hope in two ways. First, he tells us that there is an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you. It's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. That means that what Christ has prepared for you can never perish, it can never spoil, it can never fade. This glorious future can never be taken from you, and it will not disappoint you. And Christ keeps it for you. And then Peter tells us that he guards and he keeps you for this inheritance, you who by God's power are being guarded through faith. So, you get the picture. In one hand, as it were, God holds, guards, and keeps your inheritance. In the other hand, as it were, God holds, guards, and keeps you. And Peter says the day is coming when he will bring what he holds in his two hands together. 
He will bring you into your inheritance and he will bring the inheritance to you. And when that happens, you will be filled with an inexpressible and a glorious joy. And this joy of our future hope actually runs right through these verses. Uh, Look at verse 7, for example, where Peter speaks about how your faith will result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's a beautiful phrase, isn't it? The revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, he's talking about the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is often referred to in the Bible as his coming or his second coming. But here Peter uses a different word. He uses the word revelation. Now, when more than one word is used, it's usually because God in the Scripture is communicating more than one aspect of truth, and that's why different words are used. So, what's the difference between Christ coming and Christ being revealed? Because they both refer to the same event of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you know that when you have a reveal at the end of a show or at the end of a project, when you have a reveal, it is the unveiling of something that is already there. And that's the point of this word. There's a scholar by the name of Alan Stibbs that has expressed this very beautifully, and I found this so helpful this week. He says, the revelation of Jesus Christ is not the coming of someone who has hitherto been absent. It is the visible unveiling of someone who has been all the time spiritually and invisibly present. Brother, sister in Christ, you have never seen Jesus, but he has been with you every moment of your life. And when you see him, it will be the visible unveiling, the reveal of the one who all the days of your life has walked with you and loved you and provided for you. And when you see him on that day, you're not going to be meeting someone who is a stranger to you This will be, at last, the appearing of the one who has invisibly walked with you all of these years. And you're going to be seeing face to face the one who you have loved and the one who you have trusted heart to heart. And when you do, you're going to be filled with a joy that is inexpressible and full of glory. Now, this is the Christian response to Jesus. We love him, we trust him, and we rejoice in him. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. We love him because of who he is, We believe in him because of all that he has done, and we rejoice in him because of the glorious future that he has promised. Now, I want, as we come to the application of this wonderful truth, to ask two very simple and very important questions. One is why, and the other is how. Why? Why is this our response to Jesus? vast majority of us here in this service, we do love Jesus. We do believe in Jesus. We do rejoice in Jesus. Why, do, why is that true of you? How, how did that come about? There are millions of people in the world who don't, but you do. Why is that? And the second question is, how? 
because there are almost certainly some within our gathering in this service, and you would honestly say, well, I, I, I hear all this, but it seems somewhat distant from me. I'm not sure that I can really say that I love Jesus or that I trust Jesus or that I find particular joy in Jesus. And so the natural question for you would be, well, how then can this response be mine? So two questions that are really important, and they touch every one of us, one or other of these questions. Why and how? Why is this our response to Jesus? If you love Him, believe in Him, and rejoice in Him, why is that so? And Peter answers that question very clearly in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, do you see what He is saying in these very important words, He has caused us? Peter is communicating here clearly that God did something that brought you, that brought us to love Jesus, to trust Jesus, and to rejoice in Jesus. God did something to bring that about. He caused us. Now, if you think about it, you will see that this remarkable truth is clearly illustrated in the Christmas story itself. Let's think about that familiar story together for a moment. Bethlehem was sound asleep on the night when Jesus Christ was born. To the vast majority of people, even who were there at the time, the birth of Jesus didn't make any difference at all. The one exception that we're told about on the night that Jesus was born was that there were some shepherds who were out in the field keeping watch over their flocks by night. And love and faith and joy filled these shepherds when they came to the manger. But why was that? Well, you know the answer to that. It was because of something that God did. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. If it wasn't for that, it would have been just another night out in the hills for them. No, the shepherds had love for Jesus, they had faith in Jesus, they had joy in Jesus because of something remarkable that God did. And then you come to the story of the wise men sometime later, or kings, as most likely they were. And you remember that there were different responses from kings to Jesus. One king, King Herod, went into a rage of fury and murderous violence. The vast majority of kings alive at the time paid no attention to the birth of Jesus. It made no difference to them at all. But we are told about kings, probably three of them, who came from the east to worship Jesus. And they very clearly had love for Jesus, faith in Jesus, joy in Jesus when they came to worship with their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. But why did they come? Why of all the kings of the world, these three? Well, you know the answer. It was because of something remarkable that God did. God led them by a star that led them all the way to the place where Christ lay. This is right at the heart of the story. The love and the faith and the joy of the shepherds and of the kings was a direct reflection of something that God did. And here in our passage of Scripture today, Peter is telling us that precisely the same is true of us ordinary Christians who have never seen Jesus. How in the world was it that we came to love Him and to trust Him? and to rejoice in Him? Well, the answer is because of something that God did. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because in His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 
brother, sister in Christ, try and take this in this morning. It's really wonderful. Why are we here this morning? I mean, it's only a week to go till Christmas. The world's running around like crazy. And you've got plenty of things to do. So why are you here? Why are we here? Well, for the vast majority of us, the answer is very simply. We are here because we love Jesus. Amen? Amen. We are here because we believe in Jesus, right? We are here because we find joy in Jesus. But you know that there are millions not here and not in any church because they have no love for Jesus, no belief in Jesus, no joy in Jesus. So if that is true of millions, how come that it's different with you? And the answer to that is, of course, that it is something that God has done. God has caused you to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Try and take this in. This has actually happened in your life. It may have happened, of course, in the quietest possible way. But as truly as God's glory was revealed to the shepherds, as truly as God led the kings and wise men by the star, God has infused love for Jesus, faith in Jesus, joy in Jesus into your soul. No wonder Peter says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we've looked at our response to Jesus. What is it? It's a cord of three strands. We love Him, we trust Him, and we rejoice in Him. And we've asked the question, why, why is this true of us? Why are we here when others really don't care about the Lord Jesus Christ? What has happened to us? Well, there is something that God Himself has done. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And that leads to a final question that very obviously arises from all that has been said in this remarkable passage of Scripture. And that question is, how then can this be your response to Jesus? So now I want to speak to the person who would honestly say, you know, I would not describe myself as someone who loves Jesus or believes in Jesus or finds any special joy in Jesus. And you may therefore at this point very reasonably be asking the question, how can this gift then be mine? And if you're asking that question, uh, I want to respond by asking you a question. How do you know that God has not given you this gift already? See, if you have any interest in Jesus at all today, if you have any sense right now that there just might be hope for you in Him, if you feel at all that you would like to have Him in your life, which presumably you have some sense of that if you're saying, how could this gift be mine? I say that is a clear sign that God is at work in you. Others, of course, will be completely unresponsive to God, but you're not. You're asking the question, how could this be mine? Something is stirring within you, and that itself is the work of God. And you know what? It may be that last year, last Christmas, you really had no interest in Jesus, no desire for Him, no time for Him, but now you do. And what made the change? What has made the difference? The answer is very clear. It is God who is at work in you. It may be for someone in this 
third service today, that when you drove into the parking lot, you had no real interest in Jesus. You're just here because of your friends or to please someone else or because it's that time of year. But you know what? Although you had no particular interest in Jesus, when you walked, drove into the parking lot right now, something is stirring within your own soul. And you're thinking, you know what? I would like to have what Jesus offers. I'd like to have him in my life. You weren't thinking that before, but you are right now. Why the change? What's making the difference? God is working in your heart. Friends, this is how people come to faith, and right now it's happening in you. So what should you do? Well, I'm going to give you the clearest possible answer to that question, but let me do it by way of telling you a quick story from the Bible that will illustrate what you should do. The Gospels tell us about a time when Jesus came to the city of Jericho, and after some time there, he was leaving the city. And Mark tells us in chapter 10 of his Gospel that his disciples were with him, and also that there was a large crowd of people around him. Can you picture this large crowd around Jesus? Maybe a hundred people. And they're, they're with him, and they're walking at pace outside uh, of Jerusalem, onto the road, taking them to the next place Jesus is going, and Jesus is striding out, and they don't want to let him go. They're all following him, and they're taking this journey with him. And Mark tells us that there was a blind man by the name of Bartimaeus who was sitting at the side of the road. And I want you to think about this. What hope did that man have of ever getting close to Jesus? I mean, for a start, he's blind. And frankly, even if he could see, Jesus is striding out at pace, surrounded by this large crowd of people. How is he ever going to get to Jesus? Gospels tell us that this man, Bartimaeus, cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then Mark tells us that Jesus stopped. I love that. Jesus stopped. And he said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up. He is calling you. And then Mark tells us that throwing off his cloak, this blind man sprang up. That's the word that Mark uses. He sprang up and he came to Jesus. He couldn't get there quickly enough. He came to Jesus and Jesus gave him what he did not have. His sight was wonderfully restored and Bartimaeus became a follower of Jesus. Now, if you are in any way drawn to Jesus, I'm saying to you from the Bible today, it is because Jesus is calling you, and he is calling you to love him and to trust him and to rejoice in him. And you may be saying, I, I don't know how to get to Jesus. I've never really been able to figure that out. I, I don't know if I can really live this Christian life. All these people around me seem to have all this marvelous faith. I'm not sure I even have that in me. And I'm saying to you, take heart, get up. He is calling you. Here's what you must do, and here's what by God's grace you can do. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust yourself to him. Trust him to give you what you do not have. Trust him to do in you what you at this point cannot do. Love the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And you know, you won't find that so difficult as perhaps you might think because it's actually His love that is already drawing you. So, yield yourself to this love. And the more you discover of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ for you, the more you're going to find that freely and gladly you love Him in return. And maybe you're wondering, as your mind kind of battles over all of this, well, what about the sins that I would have to give up? Well, you know what? It is amazing what you can give up for love. It really is. When your soul gets filled with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to find that you have the desire and the strength to overcome the sins that have beset you for too long. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Love Him in response to His great love for you, and you will find joy in Him. And what Peter says of every Christian will be true of you, that though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we thank You for the miracle of the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank You for the miracle of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank You for the miracle by which You cause us to have new birth to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. May love for Jesus, faith in Jesus, and joy in Jesus be the response of each person here today until the day when faith is turned to sight and at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We shall see with inexpressible joy the one who we have loved and trusted all these years, heart to heart. These things we ask in the Savior's name and God's people said, Amen. Well, church, let's stand, let's sing, let's look to Jesus. He who was before there was life Walked across the pages of time He who made every living throne to wake as a child. He became like the least of us. Behold him, Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the roaring lion. Oh, be still and behold.
church, peace be to you and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Amen. God bless you. Yeah.